Hey everybody, welcome. Coach here. Hey, you know, uh, I see it dozens and dozens of times on forums like uh, Reddit, Reddit with the subreddit of landscape or plants or anything along those lines. I see this little trend quite often and it's basically people who are not in the know reaching out to people who might be in the know to solve some problems. And oh, I think that's admirable. I also think it's a uh, it's a way, uh, an easy way out, a less than self-reliant way out when it comes to plant health problems. And that's what we're talking about here this week. We're talking about an easy six-step process that you can use to diagnose potential problems of plant health in your landscape. You know, as always, I'm glad you're here. Let's get started, shall we? I believe, and it's my personal belief only, that uh, this is a very big part, a very huge responsibility that homeowners have towards their property and their landscape in general. Developing a uh, self-reliant skill and problem-solving abilities in order to uh, maintain, in some cases mitigate, in other cases cure landscape health problems goes along with being a responsible homeowner. And it also shows in what your landscape looks like. If you don't let things go, if you don't let other problems develop, your landscape's always gonna look 100% and really reflect well on you. You know, let's face it, um, plants nowadays, just like everything else, has just exploded in costs. Being at the nursery not too long ago, I saw five gallon plants that were between $49.95 and $65 for a single plant. My God, when I was selling plants in the late 70s and early 80s, holy crap, we were talking gallon and five gallon canned plants that were under $20. And here they are now approaching $65, depending on the varieties. With costs such as that, doesn't it seem uh, almost commonsensical that you should really pay attention to what and how you're putting into the ground? And once it's in the ground and established, making sure that it's always doing its best. There's not a lot of problems going on. Once again, as in other videos, I'm bringing you back to my training and my education many, many years ago that are still very applicable today. Plants are still plants. Problems are still problems. And they existed back in the 70s and 80s and they exist today. So I hope you get something from this. You know, I find these six steps as you approach a, a potential plant health problem in your landscape, really easy to remember. And you can jot them down, you can put it on a post-it out in the garage or in the shed or whatever, and just remember them. And then maybe reflect back on this video once in a while to kind of retune yourself in periodically so that you stay on the cutting edge. Do I believe that they're a cure-all for every single thing that comes marching into a landscape as far as problems? No, no, I'm a little more humble and common sense than that. I, I don't believe it's for everything, but I do believe it's for a great majority of a lot of the problems that homeowners face on a regular basis. So if you'll remember the acronym LDWCID, LDWCID, that's the acronym that we're gonna to apply to the common sense, self-reliant, easy DIY homeowner approach to diagnosing your plant health problems. When I was in the nursery business many, many years ago, I had a pretty good education underneath me, especially in ornamental horticulture. I was pretty versed on all kinds of problems and also all kinds of plants and their needs behind it. And I can remember many times being in the nursery and at the plant help desk for a few hours each shift every day, and I'd have people come in and they would bring in samples or they would call and I would tell them to bring in samples. And when they walked in, I applied this acronym to almost every single thing that walked in the door. And you know something? 90% or more of the time, we would nail it with this LDWCID. So let's start with L. L stands for location. Is the plant, and these are the, some of the questions that I would ask of my customers and clients, is the plant that you have the problem with in the right location? and I would identify the plant 
ask where it is at and what is the environment that is subjected to every day that I think might cause the problem that I see before me. A simple example would be uh, you have a shade plant out on a western exposure or a southern exposure and it would end up burning up and not growing very well and not thriving. This would be a classic example of location. Another one might be you have a, a fragile wind sensitive plant that's on a prevailing hot summer windy area in the, in the yard and as a result leaves tend to fringe up and burn up on the tips and overall health starts to diminish. So location is a good question to ask yourself. Identify the plant and then make sure it's in the right location. Maybe you bought the house and this plant was there before you got there. And maybe the previous owner or the previous owner owner maybe didn't have it in the right spot. And now you have a good leg up on diagnosing what the problem with the plant is. Okay, number two. Number two is D. D stands for depth. And when I talk about depth here, I'm talking about the depth the plant is in its planting hole. 90% of the time, coupled with a little bit of the next acronym you're gonna hear, is it tends to settle in the hole too deep. We tend to dig the hole too deep and too wide. And what happens is, is the root ball that you're putting in the ground tends to settle down. And as it does, soils, mulches, and other things start to collect around the crown of the plant. That crown is right where the trunk meets the roots. That's the crown of the plant. It's a very healthy oriented part of any type of plant. Respiration and all kinds of things go on there. If it tends to settle and then soils and other things build up along with water and moisture, you can develop a thing called crown rot very easily. And crown rot is very easily diagnosed by just peeling away some of the dirts and mulches or in that planting hole and see, see if there's a, a peeling brown rotting appearance to the trunk of that plant. And if it is, you can generally take your thumbnail or a fingernail or a small paring knife and just scrape at it a little bit. If that outer bark just falls away, chances are you got a case of crown rot. So remember, when you are planting, you want to plant with a very, very, you can dig the hole deeper, but you want it very firm when you put that root ball in there. So there's no vertical settling. And then when you have it, you want to have it up above the grade, about an inch. It'll look like you made a mistake, but you really didn't. It'll naturally settle back down with time and water. It will settle to grade and not below grade. So D, D is for depth. Moving on to W. W is water. Water is the biggest necessary evil that we have on this big blue planet. It is everything that we need and what the plants need too in various doses. We know water can be just as lethal as not having water. And many, many times, many times, I would say greater than 50% of the time, homeowners tend to water too much according to what the plant's needs are. And they also tend to group plants that are not in like with the water needs. You have a very high demand plants and then you have some very low demand plants and they're all on the same drip zone or the same spray zone. And the ones that are uh, thriving will tell you if it's the drought tolerant plants that are thriving, those ones in the bed that need a lot more water are probably suffering and vice versa. So water, water I generally go back to what old J.C. Burns taught me years ago, my mentor in the nursery industry. He always taught me about the second knuckle test, right to there. If you can scratch into a pot, you can scratch in the ground in a planting hole, and you're finding a, a great deal of moisture just within the second knuckle, then you know that further down, it's plenty wet, and you don't need to water. Just because it's a little dry on top does not mean it's dry down where the feeding root hairs are. And as a result of too much water, you end up drowning hair roots out. And if, if the hair roots can't do their job, if root rot sets in, 
it'll end up looking like it needs more water because you'll get a wilting factor because the plant cannot take up water because its root hairs are rotted away. So no uptake, wilting plant on top. For the layman, they think, ah, wilting, it needs more water. And the problem just perpetuates itself to the point where it eventually just dies. So making sure that you know what plant you have, know what groupings of plants you have, and know what their water needs are is really a leg up on avoiding root rot very much. So W for water. Too much, too little. We get it just right. The old Goldilocks theory. Okay, moving on. Number four, C. C is for critters. This one's pretty easy to diagnose, but not always. But you know, in many uh, suburban and rural areas, man, you can put in ornamental landscapes and it just becomes a smorgasbord, a buffet for the local wildlife and critters that are in the area. And when I say critters, we're talking about mammals and other things too, like snails and slugs. But mammals like deer, rabbits, squirrels, mice, rats, and all other kinds of fur bearers love, love, love some of those ornamental plants. So a real good leg up is to know the plant, know what it's resistant to and what it is not resistant to. And if you develop a problem, it's not too hard to tell. I have seen ornamental plant material that has been nibbled on, you know, like tested. Deer tend to do that. They'll nibble at it. And then if they like it, they'll munch that thing to the ground in one night. And you, you will know you got a problem. The basic cures for these kinds of things that I have found is generally barriers, either cages or deer fence or other ways of preventing the intrusion to get to your landscape. Sometimes that's a pretty big cost, especially if you have a large yard. The other thing is, is you can control your yard, but what is your neighbors doing? That's a big, big thing. Sometimes people are in tune to it, and sometimes people don't give a crap. So if Joe next door isn't trying to control problems, or Sally across the street, and you're still getting it, might want to have a talk, have a chat, work as a team. Remember when it comes to some of the subterranean critters like voles and gophers, moles, some of these guys, uh, they're so multi-generational if they're well established. You'll have grandmas and grandpas, moms and dads, and a whole bunch of babies all within the same tunnel system. And you may get, maybe you'll get grandpa or maybe you'll get one of the babies and you will have to keep up your control, whether it be traps or baits or whatever, for a long period of time, probably a whole season, in order to get control underneath. You know, there's the spring-loaded traps, some of the in-tunnel traps, there's baits, there's gases. You know, if you're more environmentally conscious, check with your local nursery and see if the, some of the more modern uh, environmentally conscious or PETA conscious type of trapping that you can do for these underground terrain critters. Finally, some of the things that uh, I see lots in the spring, lots in the shady areas, and lots in uh, established landscapes that have had no control for a long time, and that's snails and slugs. You know, those guys can have a, a real party on a lot of different kinds of plant material, and you don't always know it till it's too late. I can remember hostas, always trying to do hostas in my backyard where I used to live. And by gosh, every single year, I would have to bait for four weeks before the hostas came up in order to get the slugs and snails and all the eggs that had hatched and were now little, little snails everywhere. You know, I had to do that in order to control it and have decent hostas. So remember controls for those guys. Yeah, there's beer, there's there's commercial baits. I used to always use quarries. It just happened to work really well for me. And I don't even know if it's out there anymore, but I'm sure it is. It's a real uh, environmentally conscious type. It basically works off of dehydration. Anyway, you look up some of your own controls and see what you're comfortable with, especially if you have a bad infestation. It'll take the better part of a whole season to really get all of them under control. Okay, moving on to I. I is for infestation. Infestation, I speak basically for buggies. Buggies of 
either a flying variety, a crawling variety, uh, slithering variety, whatever. But they're basically, uh, they're the kinds that come in generally in the springtime and into early summer. The most common ones are things like uh, aphids of various kinds, spider mite, thrips, uh, woolly apple aphid, uh, scale. All of these guys tend to take time to get so established that they create a problem. Now, in control, you can find them in bottles and sprays and, and horticultural oils and all kinds of things, depending on what you have. The basic way you control them is anything from a strong stream of water on a regular basis all the way up to harsh chemicals that might be applied by a professional exterminator. Either way, you find out which level you're at and at least have some kind of an idea when things break out. Most of the time, young, new spring growth is a big attractor. So remember that time of year. Also, when it gets warm, like in the May-June time, if you're up high in the mountains, maybe into July, and then, fortunately, their lifespan comparatively is a lot shorter than mammals and other things, and they'll start to die off and, and your plants can sometimes recover. But be aware of it. Good inspection on a weekly basis is the best way. And then you decide what kind of controls you want to throw into your landscape for that infestation. Finally, our last one, number six. Number six is D for disease. Diseases tend to come around and tend to take over as a result of problems that have arose in the other five categories we've talked about here today either in the location, the depth, the water, critters, and infestations. When you have a disease problem, it's generally go back to those other five and it'll point you in the direction of why the disease is present. When you have diseases, it's like on your prize roses, or you have uh, peach leaf curl, which is a very, very hard disease to control very hard because it's more environmental, spring, cool, damp stuff that tends to make it really come on. But there are controls out there. And by looking at it, and again, knowing the plant material you have, if you have a, a nectarine and peach in the backyard, then you're gonna know that come leaf out time, right after flower, you know that you're gonna have to keep your eyes open. A good winter control, you know, two or three times spraying in the winter time with a copper spray might take care of that. There's not too much you can do after it's leafed out and the, the problem infests itself. But what you're gonna wanna do is either prune off or pull off and bag and get rid of that infected leaf material. Now, if you have diseases like black spot on roses, powdery mildew, look for the cause. One of, the, one of the causes that you can get from is you're watering at the wrong time of day. You know, Mother Nature forms dew and water in the early morning hours, just right around dawn. Think about watering then and allowing the landscape to dry out during the day. Don't water at 10 o'clock in the morning in the shady area and not have any sort of aeration or anything else going on. That's when diseases are attracted to and can infect. The other thing is, is keep your plant material healthy. Have a little bit of a feeding program out there for your perennials, for your roses, and the other plant material that are kind of uh, cyclical as far as blooming and that kind of stuff. Generally, three times a year is sufficient. I was generally a seasonal person, so four times a year, and it keeps the vigor in the plant. And just like humans, if you are healthy, you can ward off diseases and all kinds of problems. So remember, plants are kind of the same. Keep your plant material healthy and they will thrive and they can fend off a lot of stuff before you have to go jump into sprays and chemicals to take care of it. Hey guys, there we go. LDW, CID. Try to commit it to memory. Location, depth, water, critters, infestation, and diseases. It's a great self-reliant six-step approach to checking out problems that might arise in your landscape. Then with all the information we have at our fingertips nowadays, 
you can generally decide on what the best control is. And you don't have to rely on everybody else in the world to solve your problems. Self-reliance is a very big thing in my book, and I'd love for you to share it with me. That's what I have for you this week. Hey, don't forget Plan of the Week and the website out there, youryardcoach.com. If you have somebody in your circle of influence that is really looking forward to doing a landscape project, maybe they need a little education, a couple of good products for you. I also got the 15-step giveaway. As always, to your landscape success, I'll see you next week. Appreciate you staying to the end, and I hope you subscribe and give me a like. Catch you next week. Bye for now.